God says uh, a, a bizarre way. I hear the word bizarre way. <laughs> it's not just when you pray, oh God, I want you, I want a hundred million dollars to come plop down or ten thousand dollars I need to pay off my bills. Uh, the plop down and the one hundred dollar bills crisp sequ sequential numbers right in front of me. No, God's going to even provide in, in a bizarre, abnormal way that you wouldn't even think to provide for you. So if, if that's you, just take it and put it in your pocket. <laughs> glory to God, glory to God. So dare to dream again. Dream the big dreams. Dream the, dream the dreams that are uh, uh, great dreams uh, above what you could even think of. Uh, and God will take you even more than that because his word says in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 that he will do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think by the power that's in him Christ. Power that is in us. That's through the power that is in us. That's Christ, the Holy Spirit, working in us and through us. So, dare to dream the big dreams. Dare to dream again. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> Glory to God. So, this morning, well, oh, I forgot about the offering, did I not? Can't forget about the offering. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we just thank you, Lord God, this morning for the offering. We just ask you to bless it, Lord God, as we lift up the offering to you. And Lord, may we put all of ourselves, not just our finances, but everything in the basket that has no bottom. We just ask you to bless this offering. Bless both the gift and giver in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. I, I just hear the Lord about housing, houses and, 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 and things of that nature that... There's some that, that's been praying for houses and or... or, or, or uh, the word, the word is domicile. I, I don't know what exactly that means. It means a house or or dwelling place that you've been praying for, uh, uh, but that's coming to fruition uh, soon. That God has the the proper place for you. The financing is there to, for you to 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 walk into that uh, to walk in the, into that uh, that dream. I, I dare say dream. <laughs> <laughs> that that promise of the Lord or that, that thing, that gift of the Lord uh, of housing uh, so if that's you just, just, uh, just begin to receive that and begin to believe it and begin to declare that and, and walk in it walk in it, walk in it, walk in it uh -huh. And there's, there's some of us that we have been uh, declared uh, things and, and you can almost see it you can almost see the things that, that that's promised. It's like a treasure room right in front of you with a door that's open, and you can see it. But it, it almost seems off, out of hand, out of reach for you to get to. And uh, and what the thing is, there's there's spiritual barriers that has been placed by the enemy, and God wants you to 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 break through these things through the authority and dominion that he has given you to do so. He's given you all the authority and the resources to do so, to break into the things that you need, into this uh, door that seems like it's been open. I mean, like you can see this, you can see all this, well, I, see the, I see this, and you can see the, all this treasure, all this gold and like jewels, and, you, you know, you look like, you look at the, some of the, the, the books, and you can look at some of the uh, uh, pictures on the internet, and you can look on even TV shows that have like uh, uh, throne rooms and stuff, they have a whole bunch of jewels and stuff all over the place and this is what it's like I, I, I see this open Joel's room uh, and and God's saying it's time for you to break through break into to what uh, uh, he's already he's already established for you for you so uh, uh, you begin to break through break into uh, through the barriers that, that have been holding you down holding you back and these invisible barriers are not uh, I said 
say invisible because they're not in the natural, but they're in the supernatural, the spiritual things that are binding you, hold you back. You've got to break through these things, press through and break through them in the Lord. So whatever that, uh, that, that, that means to you to break through or needs for you to break through, uh, go ahead and just step into that. Begin to press into to what your promises are. Begin to look up at them instead of looking down at the ground saying, man, I'll never receive it. But God says, I have already purchased it for you. I have already promised it for you. You can see it, and, and, and now it's time for you to go get it. For now is your time, now is your season. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'll, I'll take that for myself. Put it away. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. See, we don't have to have church as normal because if we have church as normal, we get the normal thing. But I don't want the new normal thing. I want the new thing. <laughs> I want the now thing. And you know what? If, if you press in, and you know what the church should look like, the church would look like is a hospital, a hospital triage where people are coming in and getting delivered, healed. It might like look like people all over the floor totally abnormal in the natural mind but it's natural it's natural in the spiritual sense people just receiving from the Lord because there's an open heaven that uh, even as Jacob you see Jesus walked in the same open heaven that Jacob saw in his dream at Bethel the house of God where he saw the angels descending and ascending on ladders, but Jesus walked in the same open heaven, and Jesus says you could walk in the same open heaven as he walked in and under throughout his whole ministry and through his whole, whole life, that he lacked nothing. He lacked no good thing. He walked in total divine health. I believe that Jesus never was sick in a day in his life because he walked in that open heaven of divine healing and health and wholeness, as well as uh, being provided for in prosperity. He was never poor a day in his life. People say, well, Jesus was poor. He never had a house. Yeah, that's right. He never had a house. He had several. His ancestral house, one of them in Bethlehem, uh, of his dad, Dave, uh, Joseph. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> And, and, and the fact that he, at his birth, he had so much gold and frankincense and myrrh that he was uh, today would be uh, more rich than uh, Warren Buffett, uh, Bill Gates, and all of them put together. So uh, <laughs> the, to say that Jesus was poor and broke is, is not not right. He walked why? Because he walked in the open heaven that we can walk into. Hallelujah. So the, today, the Church of Sardis, if you're taking notes, we're talking about the Church of Sardis today. Hallelujah. Church of Sardis in Revelation chapter 3, 1 through 6. There's only a few verses here, six verses, to be a fact, in fact. But they're very powerful because of what, the church is, what Jesus says to the Church of Sardis. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, beginning with verse 1, to the angel, divine messenger of the church of Sardis, write these words. These are the words to him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds and you have the name, reputation that you're alive, but you really are dead. Wake up, strengthen, and reaffirm what, what remains of your faithful commitment to me which is about to die. For I have not found any of your deeds completed in the sight of God or meeting his requirements. So remember and take, your, take to heart the, the lessons you have received and heard. Keep and obey them and repent. Change your sinful ways of thinking and demonstrate your repentance to new behavior that proves a conscious decision to turn away from sin. 
So then, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. And, will not, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you still have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. That is contaminated by the, their character and personal integrity with sin. And they will walk with me dressed in white because they are worthy. They are righteous. He overcomes the world through believing that Jesus is the Son of God will accordingly be dressed in white clothing. And I will never blot out his name from the book of life. And I will confess and openly acknowledge his name before my Father and before his angels, saying that he is one of mine. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you indeed for your word. We ask you to bless your word this morning that, that we might receive uh, instructions for life. That we might walk it out every day of this week, Father God, and, and thereon. That uh, it might help us to grow and mature in you, Jesus. In your precious name, Lord God. Amen and amen. So what was going on in Sardis that warranted a word from the Lord in the first place? What was going on? Like Jesus said to the other churches that we talked about, Jesus said uh, some very stern words. And I think this is very stern what Jesus says. He comes around out and says, man, you have some deeds going on. You're outward. You look outwardly like a Christian, but I know your heart. You're dead. <laughs> or there's some of you that, that, that are dying deep inside. Spiritually and emotionally. See, Sardis was a city excitingly fabled for its past wealth and splendor. But it, it deteriorated, faded greatly. Its greatness laid, uh, lied in its past. It had been thought of as one of the most impregnable cities because of its physical arraignment of, 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 of mountains around uh, and hills for its defense. It sat on top of a hill or mountain surrounded by steep cliffs, almost impossible to scale with only one narrow way to approach. Yet Sardis has been attacked and conquered twice because of the arrogance manifested in its lack of watchfulness. They didn't watch. They thought, man, nobody can get up here, so we're, we're just going to live life, man. We're just going to just gonna be like a party time. Nobody, you know, we don't have to have anybody watch for an enemy because there's only one, you know, and that's what was their downfall. The arrogance say, man, nobody can get us. That sounds like something else, like the builders of the Titanic that, says, that, that said before, not even God can sink this ship. What kind of arrogance is that? And yet they didn't have enough lifeboats because they thought, man, this is all we have to have because this boat ain't going to sink anyways. We've got to have more room for, to put more people on. Yeah, we see what happened. <laughs> the city was famous for its wool, textile, and jewelry, jewelry <laughs> industry. Jewelry. Or jewelry, like some people say. Or can I say bling bling? <laughs> It was devoted to the worship of the goddess Sybil, or the, the idol Sybil. And no temple worshiper was allowed to approach the temple uh, of this so-called god with soiled or unclean garments. So a white, clean robe was required to approach and, and go into the temple. Now this is sound, sound, sounds like what God was saying, Jesus was saying to them. He was relating them to them on the level that they could understand. 
Andrew Tate says this in his book about the character of the city. Her worship was one of the most debased character and orgies like those of Diana were practiced at the festivals held to honor her, this, this, this so-called God. Sins of the foulest and darkest impurities were committed uh, on those occasions. And when the, uh, we think of a small community, he goes on to say, of Christians rescued from such abominable idolatry, living in the midst of scenes of the grossest depravity, with early associations and companionships and connections all exerting a force in direction of heathen, heathenism and maybe wondered that the few members of the church in Sardis were not drawn away altogether and swallowed up in this great vortex of evils. For you can see this allusion to the historical setting in the Lord's words in, in, in uh, verses 4 and 5. Now the church of Sardis, we talked a little bit about the city and how the people thought man is impregnable and they, they worship this goddess, this idol, or whatever, this big statue, uh, Sybil, which was, was uh, uh, almost identical to the goddess Diana that they served and, and worshipped in, in Ephesus and they built a big stadium to her and, and uh, worship this, this goddess with the sexual immorality and festivals that way. And, and, and this goddess Diana and Sybil, I think it was kind of interesting in Ephesians, on a red little rabbit trail, she was, the Diana was thought of in Greek, uh, Roman mythology, uh, as the goddess of the hunt. So she had flaming arrows. And Paul in Ephesians refers to, you know, the take up the, sh the shield of faith was able to quench the fiery darts of the evil one. So, we, so God, like how God uses all these, these uh, cultural, cultural things that they knew or they practiced so that they could relate and understand what, who he was, Jesus was and is. The church of Sardis, though filled with external works and activities, the church is known as the sleeping church. As Paul put it in 2 Timothy 3, 5, they had a form of godliness, but because of their failure to walk with the Lord, they were denying the real power of God through their hypocrisy. They are out of touch with the elements of true spirituality. Some of them and may have only been professing Christians engaged in religious activities who had never trusted in the little than Jesus Christ in the first place. More than likely, however, they were carnal believers who had made a good start but had failed to move on to grow and experience to true growth and, and, and maturity in Christ. They were active, engaged in works, but temporarily dead, out of fellowship with Christ. It's like 85% Barna, Barna in his studies of uh, demographics, and they go out, and I don't know how many people they have, but you know those uh, polls and stuff. That's what his company does. They go out and pull uh, like a big sample of all of the United States and, and the world. But the United States, he said, and all of the things and demographics, uh, that 85% of people in the United States say that they're Christian. But it's, the sad thing is that, you know, you can call yourself something by name, but it's about who you are and who, who, who's on the inside of you. Jesus Christ, that, that, that counts. Like I always say, and, 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 and I'm not the one who, who coined the phrase or coined the, the illustration, but I could clean out my garage and put a, a bed in my garage and I could lay down there 
But that doesn't make me a, a Chevy Monte Carlo or or a or or or, or a BMW. <laughs> no matter how long I sleep there, I, I will never be a car. <laughs> I can say that I'm a BMW, I can say I'm a Ferrari, it doesn't make me a Ferrari, I'll never be a Ferrari. <laughs> so the Lord's word to the church of Sardis here, what did he say? He said, man, you're dead. You're sleeping, wake up. It's like a church of, what's the famous thing that they have today? Zombies and the Z Nation and what is that? Uh, I hear a lot of people still talking about the, the Walking Dead, the TV show. Oh yeah, I love the Walking Dead. I don't want to see no, no, no. People with uh, scabbed up faces and oozing out. out of it. Yuck. So he said it's dead. In, in verse one, Jesus states himself in this fashion. These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, what in the world is the seven spirits of God? Well, we got to go back to uh, uh, see what Jesus is saying about his countenance in, a, uh, in, in chapter 1 to discover what these things mean. In Revelation chapter 1, we're going to go back and discover what these, what he's actually saying about the seven spirits of the seven stars. What's he talking about? It's all Greek to me. <laughs> so verse 4, John, to the seven churches that are in the providence of Asia, grace be granted to you and peace, inner calm and spiritual well-being from him who is existing forever and who was continually existed in the past and who is to come and from the seven spirits that are before his throne. That's verse 4, going back down to verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and after turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, I saw someone like the Son of Man, dressed in the robes, reaching to his feet, and with golden sash wrapped around his chest, and his head and hair were white like wool. His eyes were flashing like a flame of fire, piercing into my being. His feet was like a burnished white hot bronze, refined in the furnace. And his voice was powerful like a sound of many waters. In his hand he held, this, uh, held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword of judgment. And his face reflecting his majesty, and the Shekinah glory was like the sun shining in all of his power at midday. So Jesus says in, 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 in chapter 3, I mean, we're reading about the church of Sardis, to the one who, who uh, uh, the, the uh, seven spirits of God. Now what is he talking about here? Well, here in verse 4 in chapter 1, he refers to the characteristics of the Holy Spirit and to all the fullness of the Holy Spirit's office and power. That's what he's talking about there. The Holy Spirit's characteristics of the Holy Spirit. And these seven attributes, their seven attributes or characteristics of the Holy Spirit to which God is referring to. And as we know that the whole the Holy Spirit and the number seven means fullness or completeness of uh, that he is. The Holy Spirit's complete. He's full. He's, he's, he's God. The first one characteristic is eternalness. The Holy Spirit is eternal. It's found in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. 
The next one is truth, the characteristic of the Holy Spirit. Truth is found in John chapter 14, verse 17. The Holy Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot, re uh, the world cannot receive because it does not see him nor know him, but you know him and he dwells with you and shall be in you. The Holy Spirit of truth is in you and with you. The next characteristic is a promise of hope. Promise or hope. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. In whom also you hearing the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, in whom also believing you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The next characteristic of the, these seven spirits or, or, or the characteristic of the Holy Spirit is life. Found in Romans chapter 8, verse 2. But the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The next characteristic he's talking about is holiness. And of course the Holy Spirit is holy. <laughs> it's in his, his name. Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 1 4 who was marked out the who has marked uh, who was excuse me who was marked out the son of God in power according to the holy spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead the next characteristics talk about grace turn to somebody and say grace Hebrews 10, 29, how much, how much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy of punishment, the one who has trampled the Son of God and who has counted the blood of the covenant which he was sanctified an unholy thing and was insulted <laughs> and has insulted the Spirit of grace? Because guess what? It's by the Holy Spirit that brings grace to you and I. Which is called, uh, 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 it, it, he brings his grace to you and I even before that we're saved. He presents his grace to us, God's grace to us. He opens his grace to us. He reveals it to us. So that we might receive his son, the, the son Jesus Christ. And do you know what the chief the job of the Holy Spirit is today in the end times? Some people say, oh, they'll, they'll give us the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire, yes. But the chief, no, the chief, chief job of the Holy Spirit is to be a sign and lift up the name of Jesus Christ. There's no selfish motive or anything in, in, in the Godhead. Jesus glorifies who? The Father. Holy Spirit lifts up and glorifies Jesus. The Holy Spirit, I mean, Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit. He says, man, I got to get out of the way, go to heaven, but my, the Holy Spirit's going to come. There's no selfish motive or or, or, or I don't say bone because there's no bones. I don't know, he doesn't have no bones. <laughs> there's no selfish motive or intention in, in, in the Godhead. So that's the seven spirits that he's referring to. It's not seven different spirits that like people have been running around. It's the characteristic, the fullness of the characteristic of Holy Spirit which we just mentioned. And number two, the seven golden lampstands. What does that mean? Represented in, in, in verse two, I mean verse 12 rather, I'm sorry. The seven golden lampstands represent the churches. The churches are not separate as we brought out before of themselves. They are one. And I was doing a study on just the church of Thyatira. And I was just reading it and, and I was praying and studying the, the, the thing. 
And I thought the churches at first they stood alone and they were separate from themselves. Like, you know, this, this, God's saying this about this church and that church over there and this church and that church. And God began to speak to me. He said, said to me, no, my son, the unity of the seven churches is inseparable. They are one. Just like the menorah. I think we brought this out when we first started this, this series. The menorah. How many's ever seen a menorah before? It has seven different staves or, that have candles, supposed to have candles on them. But the, the whole thing is made of one piece. The, and uh, some, I know some in here are studying, uh, the, 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 they're around the book of Leviticus or the, the Pentateuch, and <laughs> they're trying to understand stuff. And, and this, this piece was the only piece, it was made of one piece of gold. Can you imagine that? That must have been some, some hard task, you know, making that seven different things, uh, uh, candlesticks or, or, or staves, out of one piece of gold. They was beating and, and the, the putting the fire. I don't know how they do it, but I know I do, like 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 show that show that's on that they uh, uh, smiths are are competing against each other, making swords and stuff. But that was beaten into one piece, of one gold piece, and seven different things. And in the middle, there's a big stave that comes down. And, and, a, and, and a pedestal like thing that you put that that it's that's holds the whole thing together and it's all one piece and in the middle there's there's a horizontal uh piece of gold that that that's all one still one piece they beat it i don't know how they did it but it's one piece of gold but they they, they it comes out and that whole thing forms in the shape of a cross and I like that because Jesus says everything in the Old Testament is a foreshadow or a type of the new thing that's come to come. So that represented the, gold, the cross in the middle of the staves. And, and, and the, stave, the candles themselves, sticks themselves, represent the church, the seven. And Jesus is in the middle of everything. The cross, the work of grace is in the middle of the whole church. And I like how that is. And it's inseparable. And the number seven means complete or whole thing. The whole church. Do you know what? In, in the Nicene Creed, it says we believe in one holy Catholic church. Holy Catholic church! Holy cow, Batman, what are you talking about? The word Catholic means universal, means worldwide church. They thought it as one holy church together. Not this church over here in Alexandria and, and over here in Constantinople, not a church in Rome, but everybody was together. And that's what God is saying to the church here. In fact, in Revelation chapter 120, it says, For the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels or divine messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, I've read a whole bunch of study and studying this, this and studying it out through uh, uh, school and throughout my ministry of studying eschatology which is the study of end times and there's a lot of st stuff that you know this means this and this means that you know I received that this means this and it says Jesus says here what it means <laughs> so you can say oh well, this means this and it means that but wouldn't it be just simpler just to read what Jesus says it means hey, seven lampstands are the seven churches and the third thing we see, Jesus talking about the seven stars he holds in his right hand, mentioned in verse 16. Chapter 1, verse 16. 
And in his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword of judgment in his face, and reflecting his majesty, Shekinah glory, the sun shining, all of his power in midday. See, the fact that these stars are in Jesus' right hand indicates that they are important and under his authority. Anytime you read anything in the Bible that says right hand, even in, in, in their cultural time, right hand means authority and power. Right hand means authority and power. So these, whatever the stars were, they were under his authority. The right hand is a sign of strength and control. Jesus explains to John that the stars are the angels of the seven churches. In Revelation 1.20, the angel is literally a messenger. A messenger. So, what Jesus is saying, the leadership of the church, the leadership of the church, he's talking, to, and, and every church he says, to the angel, or to the messenger, or to the leader, or the, the pastor, or the bishop, or overseer of the church of Ephesus, or Smyrna, or Pergamos, write these things. He knows these things. So it's the, it's the pastors he, he, he writes these to. Hey, you know what? Overseer, bishop, pastor, whatever you are, leader of the church. I, he's saying, I, I hold them in my, uh, in my authority, in my power, in my right hand. And, and I love this. This is going out over the internet. To all of our pastors over in 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 in, in, in uh, Liberia, <laughs> and all over the world, that He holds you in His right hand, under His authority, in His power, in His control, in His protection, in his, under His governance. He holds you in his peace, his joy, his divine health, everything. You're held in his hand. It's an interesting little song. He holds the whole world. So you can say, he holds the whole leadership of the church in his hand. So he holds all of us in leadership in his hands in the church. Saying, you're mine. You're under my control. And, and, and we listen and submit to him. As he leads us. But he's also saying, as I lead you, you lead my church. In verse 1, we see in chapter 3, Jesus says, I know your deeds. You have a name, a reputation, that you're alive, but in reality you're dead. In all these letters, the life of the church is revealed in its deeds. Our, the Lord says, he, he, uh, as he does in uh, most of the other letters, I know your deeds, I know your works. In Sardis, these works that were, done to, uh, they were being done to impress people. Let's give them the appearance of we do have something going on that's right, you know, in, in the place. Because after all, this is God's house. We got to do something. So it's almost like a masquerade, you know, you put on this happy face. <laughs> like you see those commercials with the, about the, uh, 
antidepressant uh, pills that they have on you depressed you know you put on they, they put up this <laughs> drawled on face with a smile on it <laughs> and that's what they had the appearance of they were had the appearance they were alive but they were dead it's like the weekend at Bernie's <laughs> these two guys that that that, that had a that their friend died and, and they had to give an appearance that he was alive so they were they dressed him up every day and they, they had him do things like go boating with them and people come by and they would fake by waving up a hand like this and him waving and stuff it was kind of funny that was like these people were Jesus said, I know your deeds, I know your works. In Sardis, these were works that were done by, to impress me. They gave this church uh, a, a, a name to live. They had good reputation, but it was actually a dead church. The members of it were, for the most part, not even believers. They were not spiritually alive. They were what you call nominal Christians, by name only. You have, an, uh, have a name to live, Jesus says, but you're not alive. You're dead. This indicates the church was made up of people who outwardly professed Christ. Probably many of them thought of themselves as believers, but who actually possessed no spiritual life at all. They were Christians in name. A, a contemporary po poet one, has once described churches like this in his own words. Outwardly splendid as of old, inwardly lifeless, dead and cold. Her force and fire all spent and gone. Like the dead moon, she still shines on. There's unfortunately, there are churches like that around the world today. It is what gives non-Christians such a negative impression of Christ and, and Christian faith. They see the profession, they hear the wonderful words, but there's no life in it, nothing backing them up. These churches consist largely of what someone has described as mild, mild, mild uh, that, that's all folks. <laughs> Mild-mannered people meeting in mild-mannered ways, striving to be more mild-mannered. Like I said, Hollywood has given a name to people like this. They call them zombies. Corpses that are alive. That walk about as though they are, are, are living, but they're really dead. As we read this letter, we are looking at the first zombie church. The first zombie church. They ought to, they ought to have a movie like that or, or shows like that. Zombies in church. That was the first zombie church. It was the Sardis. There was a poet by the name of Calvin Miller who wrote a, a poem called The Singer. He says, many Christians are really Christaholics. They're not disciples at all. Disciples are cross-bearing, they seek Christ. Christaholics seek happiness. Disciples dare to discipline themselves and the, demand and, and the demands they place on themselves leave them enjoying the happiness of their growth. Christaholics are escapists looking for the shortcut to nirvana. Like drug addicts, they are trying to bomb out of their depressing world. The Lord says the Sardis in, is a church that has a reputation to live, but is really dead. It is a church of Christaholics. But there was time, apparently, when the church was alive. When it was filled with people who knew the Lord because they knew him, they served the homeless and the needy of the city. That is the way they won the reputation. 
They appeared to be people committed to good works, but now there was no life. They were just doing the good works out of service. It'd be nothing more than the United Way or Coffee and Social Club. Paul warns of us in that condition in his great chapter called the love chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, though I speak in tongues, have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge and have faith and can move mountains, but have not love, I am resounding gong or clanging cymbal. Here was a church that once had a great ministry, but it had slipped away. It once had was a great impact in a city for Christ in Sardis, but nothing was happening in spiritual growth when, when, when Christ Jesus said to, to the church of Sardis here in, in Revelation through John. Dr. William Barclay has, this, has said, a church is in danger of death when it begins to worship its own past. When it is more concerned with forms than, than with life. When it loves systems more than it loves Jesus. When it is more concerned with material than it is with spiritual things. There are churches here in, in today that they're more concerned with their cathedral churches, buildings, than they are for people. How dare you spend our money when, uh, you know, because we're worshiping the great stained glass windows that we have. Lord forbid that we as a church ever become like that. But it's sad to say there are some out there that, that have or, or that profession. They worship the stained glass windows more than they worship God and they, they love what he loves, the lost of this, uh, lost of this world and spiritual things. The church of Sardis was so devoid of life that it actually had no struggles going on within it. When everybody's dead, you don't have no quarrels. <laughs> Notice the difference between the other churches. There are no Jewish, there's no Jewish accusers of this church. Even though there was a large colony of Jewish settlers in the, in the town itself. There was no Nicolaitans. <laughs> there were no false apostles or prophets there. There was no female seducers as in Tyre, Tyre. There was nothing. Zilch. Zero. That's what's the church, that was the church of Sardis. You know what, the enemy will leave you alone if you're dead. If you're on the way of dying. Dare I, dare I say, if you have no struggles, the enemy's not coming after you in one way or another. Better check your spiritual pulse. We better check our spiritual pulse. Because if you're when you're alive in Christ, be sure the enemy will come after you. But but don't be afraid because greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. You have authority and dominion and power over him. So what does Jesus tell them to do for the solution to the problem? In Revelation chapter three, two, I mean chapter three, verse two to three, it says, "Wake up!" Turn to somebody and say, "Wake up!" And strengthen, reaffirm that what remains of your faithfulness, commit to me, which is about to die, for I have not found any of your deeds completed in the sight of God or meeting His requirements. So remember and take heart the lessons you have received and, and heard. Keep and obey them. And repent. Ch 
charge, change your sinful way of thinking and demonstrate your repentance with new behavior that proves a conscious decision and turn away from sin. So then, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know what hour I will come. The first thing we see Jesus tells them to wake up. The first need of the church that is dying or dead to awaken to its condition. The words in the Greek are a, com a command. Sharp words like a slap in the face. Designed to stimulate, to wake up in the letter to Ephesians. Paul says, wake up, O sleeper. Arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. In chapter 5, verse 14. This was the need of the church here in Sardis. Wake up! They needed to realize that they were dull and apathetic, a void of all life itself. It's like when a doctor's need to use a defibrillator to restart someone's heart. The doctor's charged up the paddles. They say, stand back! And then they go, press them down, and they go, tch, 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 electric shock. Then some sinus rhythms, rhythms go on the monitor, but it soon dies out. Then they shock them again. Some sinus rhythms, rhythms. Oh yeah, they're alive, they're alive, but they soon fade out. Jesus is telling them as to shock their apathetic, devoid of life, hearts to wake up. They had become zombie-like Christians that only did things for God. And in fact, their works became their Christianity without no inner faith to back it up. It's true that James said that faith without works is dead. But the truth is the same if we say works without faith is dead. He then says, strengthen what remains. Not only does he say, wait, wake up. But he says, strengthen that what remains. What was that? Jesus has already told them that the value, uh, there, there, there uh, is of uh, value in the church. He says, I know your works. He says, they are good works in a way, but they're incomplete. Strengthen what remains and, uh, and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of God. Their works were incomplete, unfinished. The actions were right, but their motives were wrong of their heart. They were not doing them for the right reasons. As you read this, you can see that there is a church that is busy doing good things, but doing them to impress people. They were trying to display and enhance a reputation they had. They were concerned as to whether people around would see and know what they were doing. But Jesus says, even those good deeds were about to die. Strengthen them, he says. How? By putting their motives right. Having a heart of faith in Jesus Christ. See, God reads our hearts. He is judging whether our works are done out of love for Him and gratitude for what He has done for us and not caring whether people see them or not, whether we are praised for them or not. I remember back in, in college and, and God began to speak to me about ministry and doing things for him and and i remember what he said to me he said he said son after you graduate would you just be grateful and ministry for me as a, a somebody who works and this is what he said if somebody works for say like mcdonald's or somewhere and the only ministry that you would do is in your prayer closet at home. Would you still be grateful? Would you still be, uh, have, have faith in doing ministry for me? 
I'll never, I'll never forget that. He said, now, nobody else is going to see you or give you any, any accolades or anything. And I believe that's what he's asking for. And when we read about this church, see, they were all about, hey, attaboys, hey, attaboy, that's good. You know, you're going out there having a soup kitchen. Oh, that's great. What this church needed was capture again the meaning of the words for the Lord's sake and as unto him. Everything you do in your heart, not for the praise of men, but unto the Lord. I worked at a place called Modern Glass. It was pottery. I, and my workstation was, was the cleanest. I'm not patting myself on the back. Everybody would hate me for that. And they would say, why don't you just take a break? You know, they would hide and, and when they're not doing anything, when nobody else is around, they would, they would hide in what we call shamming out, you know, of their work duty. You know, if, I, I believe, you know, if, if I'm getting paid, no matter what it is, eight, ten dollars an hour, I was getting paid to work, not just to sit around. So my place was that I, I swept up. I did things when, when I, uh, there was nothing else to do. I found stuff to do. And of course, people didn't like me for that. It says, no, I'm not working for my boss. I'm not working to get praise from her or him. I work for, for, for a, a, a heavenly boss. And his expectations are way far exceed any earthly boss. And even the crickets are in here praising and, and saying amen. <laughs> in a Time Magazine interview, Mother Teresa, she said these words, we try to pray through the, our work by doing it with Jesus. For Jesus to Jesus. That helps us put our whole heart and soul into doing it. The dying, the crippled, the mentally ill, the unwanted, the unloved. They are Jesus in disguise. What a wonderful spirit that is. What this church in Sardis so desperately needed. They needed to do everything unto Jesus wholeheartedly. He also says, so remember and take heart. He also said, wake up. Remember what you did. So remember and take heart the lessons you have received and, and, and heard. Keep and obey them and repent. Change your sinful ways of thinking. In the, in, in the Greek, it's not what, but how. How you have received. What they heard, of course, was the gospel. They have heard the message of Jesus, the crucifixion on behalf of sinners, his resurrection, his availability to human beings by the Spirit to strengthen them and impart to them his own righteousness, life, righteous life and, and position. They have heard it all. But the important thing was, how did it come to you? Remember that you received and heard this. What he was referring to is the ministry of Holy Spirit. Remember, he is the one who holds the seven spirits. When these peoples had first heard the gospel, they have heard it by the Holy Spirit. The word came to them in the power of the Spirit. How do you lay hold of the Holy Spirit? How do you bring the Spirit's life back in the church, which has given the gospel in the briefest form? What he says, Jesus says to them, repent and believe. Repent means look at yourself and see the wrong attitude, your wrong outlook, your self-appraisal as unacceptable before the Lord. Then believe. 
Cast your whole self upon the grace of Jesus. Receive him and the word of grace. Let it take deep root in your heart. He will impart to you life, the life of the Holy Spirit. That is what the members of this church needed to repent and believe. Then he also says, So then, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come to you. What they also need to do is recover the hope of the Lord's return. He said, if you don't wake up, Jesus will come to you as a thief in the night. The same aspiration that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, 43, he says that he will come suddenly without warning like a thief comes to steal away the treasure of a home. The sad thing is there are people who are in the church that are not part of Christ, who know Jesus by name only, who do not possess a relationship with him as Lord and Savior of their lives. It is for these people Jesus is sounding out a clear warning to repent, or it may be too late. Beloved, he's coming soon. And as I've heard him say many times as of late, says, I am coming sooner than what you think. So in verse 4 and 5, he says this in cl closing. Jesus tells them that there are remnant people in the church that are still alive, have an intimate relationship with them, are alive. There are still people there. He says, those people will have a white robe, white linens and garments upon them. And I like what Isaiah 118 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as like wool. You know what's funny about that is you go try to, uh, you can't try to translate this or, or try to explain to people our, our brothers and sisters in Africa about this verse and they don't know what snow is They're like what's snow <laughs> that is what the blood of Jesus can do Jesus makes us white as snow the Lord promised three specific things to them first they would be dressed in white they will be given his own righteousness. Second, he promises, I will never brought, blot out his name from the book of life. He will hold you. Just like Romans chapter 8 says in the last letter part, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he goes through this whole dis, uh, uh, this discourse of angels or, or demons who shall anything be able to separate us from the love of God he said no because God loves always holds us and completes us but we always have a choice to make we could we could leave him what a wonderful assurance saying you know he he, he, he has our back he holds us he will never leave. The third thing Jesus promised, I will confess and openly acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels, saying, that one is mine. I will acknowledge you before my Father and the angels in heaven. Everything that was done, Jesus will say, this is my son. This is my daughter. What a glorious day that will be. Not only then, but he openly declares to us now and to everybody, to his Father. And that's why he says in the book, you know, so we have an advocate with the Father, someone who's praying for us, someone who's believing in us, someone who's, who's on our side in heaven, someone who's declaring that that's my son, my daughter, because they were bought with my blood and brought by the Holy Spirit. So in closing today, let us bow our heads and pray.
Father, we just come to you. In Jesus' name, Lord God, today, we thank you, Holy Spirit. We ask you, Father, to apply your word to our lives and our hearts. To come and, and assure us and, and wake us up if we need waking up, Lord God. So that we're fully alive in you, Jesus Christ. Fully have a, a heart relationship with you. An intimate knowledge of you. And, and inviting you in our heart as you knock at the door of our hearts. Of all of us. All of humanity. You're knocking on our hearts. To see if we'll open up. Saying, Jesus, come. I invite you into my heart and my life. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sins. And what a wonderful thing to believe and repent and believe and receive the Holy Spirit, the infilling of the Holy Spirit that will lead us and change us and make us new, a new creation as your word says, Lord. And we just thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray a, pray a blessing on everyone. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Shalom. Nothing broken, nothing lacking. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And everyone said, Amen and Amen.